Hi everybody, this is Zane with Sailing Views. I've got Gail Turlick here. She is a extraordinary sunfish sailor and I've known her for most of my life. Um, Gail, how are you doing? Doing really good today. It was sunny till about five minutes ago and for up here it's getting warmer. I'm in uh, Michigan. Yeah, I'm sure the uh, weather up there is just as beautiful as it is down here in Alabama. <laughs> All right, so Gail, I'm going to grill you with a couple questions, and let's see how you answer. Um, okay. We'll start with this. What age did you start sailing, and how did you get started? Well, my current answer is I'm pretty sure I started sailing in utero. Um, my <laughs> family are all sailors, and uh, I know I was, you know, like definitely on something with sails up and walking by the time I was two. I got gotcha. you. Okay, so good early age. All right, who had uh, early influences on your sailing, uh, be it racing or just getting started, or who taught you a lot? Just something along those lines. My dad probably had a lot of influence, but didn't force the issue on us kids at all. Um, he's a star sailor, and he's still with us, which is really awesome. Very good. Um, and so at that time sailing out of jackson park yacht club in chicago and we just got brought along and everybody was there for each day of racing and hung out and uh eventually ended up doing race committee for about five years because my brothers had to be observed while my mother was crewing and <laughs> i don't know and one thing led to another and dad ended up getting a big boat but when I was about eight, another friend told me about sailing school. And I was very intrigued by that. I really hadn't done anything on my own to that point. And absolutely being able to be there with my friends, make more friends, um, and then eventually learn to steer and become my own captain. And then came race week. And uh, the rest is history because the race week thing really lit me. And the next year I was in the intermediate fleet and graduated to Blue Jays. And uh, the rest is really history. I've been okay. racing ever since. And okay. I think I was nine or maybe 10. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings the history part brings me to at what point did you think you were good? When did you think you actually had a chance to be able to become a really good sailor and start winning races? When I was about 13, uh, I was sailing at Chicago Yacht Club in Belmont Harbor, and the club did away with the Blue Jays and got 420s, and I started winning. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> so at 13, you figured out you were actually pretty good at it. So all I was right. getting pretty good at it. Yep. All right. And, well, uh, good. But I was also one of the very few that did both spring and fall frostbiting and the whole summer sailing school, even into my teens. And then they ended up adding a Thursday night 420 series. And so I did that too. And then my sailing school instructor um, had a 470 with a partner. And invariably, one or the other wouldn't be able to make it, and then I would crew for them on the 470. So I was out on the wire and flying the kite from the wire, and oh, oh, that was so fun. Yeah, the good times. And then, you know, that was at Wilmette Harbor on the north side near our home. And I was also a Mariner Girl Scout, so I had access to the Mariner fleet. They had two arrows and a wood pussy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you got to love the boat names back then. Um, well, those still exist. There's still yeah. a fleet here in Michigan that I would just learned about. And I was kind of blown away. But so we had, I had so many opportunities. I sailed Stars. I sailed Etchells. I sailed J24s. I sailed I mean, pretty much anything I could get my hands on. Ended up in the Sunfish. Uh, U.S. Sailing added the Smythe Trophy for single-handed youth. Mm -hmm. And... Um, a lady named Jean Bergman, actually at the time was Jean Maher, was before yeah. they were married. <laughs> yeah. And uh, loan me a boat, and that starts another whole very long history. Very good. And great passion. Yeah, I know all Jean. I love Jean. 
So they're okay. doing good. Yep, that's always good. I love seeing them. Okay, so uh, what do you do for a living? How do you sail, or are you in the sailing industry, or what do you do? I think you have to count me in the industry. I'm a executive director for Lake Michigan Sail Racing Federation, the regional sailing association for the greater Lake Michigan area, as defined under U.S. Sailing, the national governing body for the sport, which is then a part of world sailing. So, um, so that makes you a professional. It's supposed now. to be. It's supposed to be part time, <laughs> but go ahead and laugh your butt off because if I have a week that I only am doing it for forty hours, it's a true miracle. Yeah. And then there's all the other volunteer stuff I do for the sport too. Yeah, I remember talking to you about all the sunfish stuff you do. So yeah, I know you're busy. Okay, so what's your favorite boat and why? Ooh. I think my very favorite boat so far, because it could always get knocked off, is the uh, Nelson Merritt 68 that was raced as a Great Lakes 70. Mm -hmm. um, just because of the sheer beauty, balance, and power in that magnificent craft. Yeah. Got to sail on her for nine years and miss it desperately. Now, they just cut that boat up, didn't they? Or was that a no, different that was a different boat. Okay. All right, <laughs> good. I was about to say, I think I know the boat you're talking about. So yeah, no, that was uh, Benetti Forty Four that I think okay. now is at the scrapyard. Okay. No, um, the partner with my father, his daughter bought him out, and uh, she's been refitted a little bit and uh, still races out of Chicago a little bit. But more, they sort of cruise with their giant family with it. Okay. Well, so. it's a good, fun, fast cruiser. All right. Yeah. So what's your favorite place to sail? Because I know you've been everywhere, so. Oh, boy. I know this is a hard one. I think right here on Gull Lake, the water yeah. is so clean. And it's so beautiful here. We've got a mile and a half wide and six miles long. And so we can always get a race course set up. And the cost is controllable when you do it the way we are with just a small paper club and using a public ramp. And easy in and out and just fun. Okay. Well. But at the same time, you know, I adore doing the Mackinac race on the Great Lakes, and I do try to do both every year. So um, I would have guessed you would have said Bermuda or... I haven't or, been there yet. You haven't been to Bermuda? Oh, wow. No, okay. it's, it's still really tough. This will... Men, pay attention. Mm -hmm. It's still really tough as a woman to get on to offshore boats. Yeah. I've... Uh, last few years really been scrounging trying to keep my port here on string going and i've learned that there's still about half of the boats in every fleet that are absolutely male only and always will be hmm. Interesting. yeah yeah i would have thought that would have, would have changed by now um nope <laughs> all right okay next question uh where do you see sailing going in the future oh boy well, short term, because of the coronavirus and the quarantines, I really see single-handed and double-handed sailing to be the brief, probably two-year spike, um, because people just aren't going to be willing to be close to each other, but they're still going to want to be able to get out on the water. Um, some people are going to have some spare time they haven't had and we'll finally pursue learning how to sail. Um, and that's something that even uh, Kenny and Brad Reed were mentioning last week in a call I was on. Um, I think it's, you know, I, I'm always advertising and encouraging and whatever, but I, I think that's gonna be true for the short term. For the longer term, um, when we look at the millennials and beyond, they're all accustomed to not being boat owners. 
and somehow there's going to have to be owned, maintained fleets of whatever's going to be raised, wherever it's going to be raised, with charter fees and that kind of thing that I wasn't raised on. And when I've had a charter, I just, you know, kind of take a deep breath and write the yeah. check and wonder <laughs> why I've got this trailer full of stuff and boat shed full of stuff. <laughs> and you're not getting to use it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but I, I really see that's so more of like a clock, a forward, yacht club plus, you know, storage and access and mm -hmm. all that's becoming a really big issue. Um, even National Marine Manufacturers Association recognizes that, and I'm active with them too. I got gotcha. you. Okay, next question. Uh, what's uh, the best regatta or the best sailing trip you've ever had? Or which one sticks out in your mind the most? Well, there's only about probably 2,000 of them. Um, Just a few. Really, the best race for me, and a lot of people will probably be put off by this a little bit, was the 2011 Mackinac race, Chicago Mat. Um, there was this gigantic storm. I was on Poa Roca, the Nelson Merrick 68 in the Great Lakes 70 class. And we had rounded Can 3 and we were in the Straits of Mackinac when it hit. And then we hit a lull. Mm. And there were slight handicaps in the class because the boats were all a little bit different. And at the time we were winning. I don't know if we knew it, but at the time we were winning. But then we went into a two hour hole after the storm. Yeah. And so we're doing everything we can to try to get to that finish line. And we only had about 19 miles to go. Yeah, you're almost there if you're in the straits. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, we're, we're just all dying. We're like, do we put up a sail? Do we not put up a sail? Because it had blown. It turned out the what hit us was 100 miles an hour. Yeah, <laughs> I remember reading about that storm. Yeah, that was, that was um, a rough one. And so we just had this two hour lightning show. It never went dark. And there was just this low rumble. It wasn't, you know, big cloud to ground and big bangs. It was just this steady, steady two hour rumble. Hmm. It, and, but you couldn't really see that anything was coming. We didn't, I think there was a total of seven of us in the Straits and then everybody else was further south at least south of the Foxes, and that's where there was a major problem. Yeah. The um, sport boat capsized, I think eventually turtled, and two sailors were killed in the flip. And, you know, we were far enough away that we couldn't have gone back to help or anything and didn't really know what happened until we finished. Yeah. But we had our hands full. So then, the second squall hit. And it was only those of us in the Strait that had the joy of experiencing this twice. <laughs> and by then, we had been waiting and waiting and waiting, and the call finally came, you know, get the number one up. We gotta get there. <laughs> yeah, go fast. Uh -huh. So the one gets up, winch handle goes in, like one click and wham, <laughs> the second squall came. And yep. so the spreader tip was in the water and I jumped down to ease out the main. And I don't even remember who was trying to trim, but of course that got let go. And so then came the call for a knife. So I handed my brother my knife and he cut off the port Genoa sheet right at the knot. And that got us up to about 50 degrees. True. Got the spreader tip out of the water. And then he went down and, you know, ankle deep, knee deep, and cut the other sheet. Oh. And that got us up to about 35 degrees. And then the whole rig is just absolutely rattling. And we had a brand new main, virgin mainsail. Not anymore. And so I'm trying <laughs> to keep just a little bit of tension 
on that leaf so it doesn't just absolutely get blown apart. I'm, I'm watching all this. I'm just like, oh, this is just nuts. And, you know, lightning and thunder and rain and all that stuff. <laughs> And so the whole thing's rattling, the whole thing's rattling. And then the Luff tape pulled out of the, um, what do you call it? The twin Luff. On the, oh, on and the so, jib? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, after about five more minutes of now this whole thing really rattling and catching. Yeah, because now the, it's a big uh, spinnaker instead of a jib. Just blowing everywhere. The, uh, mm -hmm. the tack shackle finally gave. Good Lord. So then we have <laughs> basically a kite flying horizontally <laughs> from the masthead. Mm. And we were still probably 15 degrees over. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, yeah, that doesn't help when it's that high. Uh, yeah. Good Lord. Oh, we might have been more because the rudder still wasn't in the water. We couldn't steer. Oh, wow. And so that was killing me because I knew if we could get that rudder in, we'd get to the island. <laughs> yeah, you could go down, you can turn, you can get things under control. Like, we just want to get there. We want to win, <laughs> you know. So, no, by the time we got everything under control, and I don't remember what we put And this is your we best got... sailing experience ever, really? Oh, I, I love storms. I love <laughs> storms. My favorite sunfish story is uh, at Lewis, Delaware in our 50-mile-an-hour storm. Wow. Mm. Yeah, I'm a little whacked. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> so, uh, and we ended up fourth. Uh, All of that, and we ended up fourth in class. Well, that wasn't too bad. All right, no. so this brings me to the next question. If that was your best, what is your worst sailing experience? And I know we've talked on the phone. I hope you don't name me. <laughs> name her. No, place. I will not. It was a uh, Port Huron Mac on a boat that I knew the people that own it. They're sunfish sailors. Mm-hmm. And they had cobbled a crew together, and it was a very rough Port Huron. And uh, I don't even know if we had crossed the starting line when the first person got seasick. By the time we got to Cove Island, four people were seasick and in births. And shortly before Cove Island, one of the owners somehow slipped in the head and hit her head and had a concussion and climbed in her bunk. And so she was down too. And so there was three of us left, the other owner and me, and this lady that was learning to sail that year, but she was a retired police officer, sheriff, I think. Mm -hmm. And so she had learned enough that she had a vague idea and she had been watching, was learning. And so if you gave her direct instruction, she was fantastic. She would go and do it and go back and get back on the rail. She didn't care about getting wet. She didn't care about any of it. And it was still screaming, you know, a typical going west and the winds out of the west. And that's how the Port Huron always ends. <laughs> and, and so I had only had about four hours of sleep going up because I was one of the more experienced people on board and they kept waking me up for this and that. And so I was exhausted. So what we did was tied a rope between me and the other owner. And I would curl up down on the floor of the cockpit and try to nap. And he would steer until he couldn't see anymore. And then he would shake the rope and then I would go steer and I would keep doing it until I couldn't see anymore. And then I would pull the rope. Wow. <laughs> And that's how we finished. We had three of us on deck and, you know, we tacked and did whatever we had to do. And we eventually got there and I mean, super nice people. They were a lot of fun, but definitely a very, very difficult race. Yeah, that doesn't. And I will leave the names out. Yeah. Okay. There you go. That uh, doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun. Okay. So what is the uh, strangest thing you've seen float by? Probably the trash off of Cuba. Hmm. And you could tell it was Cuban trash because there were no logos on it. <laughs> there was no McDonald's. There was no Burger King. There was no um, 
So it was just a big pile of trash or it was, you know, it was all fast food wrappers and that kind of thing and plastic bags and, but there was no logos on anything. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Yeah, that was notable. That was already, I can't believe it was four years ago. Hmm. All right. So what is your best role on a boat? What do you do best on the boat? Are you a driver, tactician, trimmer? Help. Helm, okay. So you're better helmsman than anything, okay. All yeah, right. I'm good at trimming sails too, but pretty much I climb on board. I might be pulling a sail a little bit, and I'll go come and drive. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I do have what four or five Mac six Mac wins. Yeah, I mean you've you've and been at it a while. Over half or top tens and. You know, Sunfish Regatta wins, Flying Scott Regatta wins. How is that I'm Flying Scott out. doing? Oh, I sold her. What? I gave you sales and you sold it? I did. Uh. Yeah. I didn't, I couldn't use her enough to make it worthwhile to pay for having the club here. I got you. And uh, things got really complicated last year. And another Sunfish buddy really wanted a Flying Scott. So, well, there she's you go. A really good home. All right. Uh, okay. So on the water, when you're when you're racing or something like that, do you consider consider yourself aggressive or conservative, or where do you think you fall into that role? More aggressive, but frustrated aggressive. <laughs> okay. Explain that a little bit. Frustrated aggressive. I have just never ever been able to park on a starting line. And stay in the front row. If I'm not moving at 10 seconds, they're all they're all gone. Hmm. Okay. Not so much so, with the big boats though. Yeah. All right, so you but consider like your, I can keep up. You're aggressive mainly because you just come charging in late and flying well, and through. plus I just want to beat everyone. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, and, well, uh, you know, if somebody fouls me, they're going to know they did. Yeah, I really believe in people sailing by the rules. It's the only way to make the game fair. I got you. All right. So what is the greatest maneuver or the biggest trick you've ever pulled off, you know, during a race? You know, a great start, a great mark rounding, something like that. You know, the Sunfish World Championship last year in Bonaire, I didn't have all that great a regatta, but I did have two really good races. And there was one start that I actually did had the you know sail fluttering and had to trim in and go. And somehow I was the one that got spat out. And I hear all these people yelling my name, and it was the coolest thing. Because <laughs> I'm not usually the one that gets spat out, not out <laughs> front. I usually get spat the wrong way. Uh-huh. And so that was really cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's the greatest uh, or your favorite project or the greatest big boat program, little boat program? What, what's a good project that you've been involved in that you really enjoy or really like? Oh, I would still have to say it's uh, Poa Roca, the okay. Great Lakes 70. Yeah, the nice right. big boat. Mm-hmm. It was, and yeah, you know, did tons of work. I, boat's always been in the Chicago area or it was in Muskegon for a little while. And when it was there, I was able to go help more. But, you know, when I was in Chicago and I was in Chelsea, it was a lot of miles to go for a day. (laughs) (laughs) I do what I can. And so, you know, I would pitch in other ways. I took care of making meals and marketing and some of that stuff. And because it takes the whole team to get everybody out there. And with a big boat like that, there's a lot of bodies. Yep. Okay, so America's Cup. Do you love it? Do you hate it? What do you think of it? Um, what are your thoughts? I'm, I'm no longer really a fan. It's it, it's so hard to relate to. You know, when the foiling came on, I kept asking people to take me, let me try, you know, can I play with your boat for 20 minutes or whatever, and... It didn't happen. And that's already, what, 15 years ago or something. Yeah. And so they've just all sort of sailed away from me. Um, I love 
having a traditional big boat crew uh, working together where they're actually doing sailing maneuvers. So I'm kind of in the Tom Eamon club. Yeah. You know what that means. I do, I do. I follow yeah. Tom, so yeah. Uh, we're lifetime friends. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Yeah, I mean, there's something to be said about, uh, you know, there's a new foiling technology and as, as fast and as cool as it is, but also there's, you know, a lot of good things to be said about the old days, whereas, you know, tactics and covering and lee bows and, you know, spinning circles at the start. You know, I, I love that stuff. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, nowadays it it's a sailing. whole different machine. It is sailing. Right. But, and I'm sure there's still lifts and knocks and all that. Oh, yeah. But it's just so technical and it's computer driven that, I mean, they're in helmets and body suits. And, you know, I mean, Borg is a friend. He's lost half his hand yeah. because of the boiling. Um, you know, I think for the high end people, all that stuff will continue to be pursued. But I think for recreational, race, recreational racing, that's going to have to be another focus to uh, somehow maintain the more traditional sailing. I mean, one thing that I keep trying to profess to all, I think every kid in the United States should learn to sail. I think it should be part of their school education. Because if it wasn't for sailing, there would be no United States of America. Yeah. I agree. I mean, you know, everybody got everywhere through sailing, so they had to learn somehow. So, yep. All right. Well, the and next it teaches question. Some physics. Yes. You yes. know, <laughs> it teaches you a lot. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, what are your future plans in sailing? I know, uh, you know, the virus has us all knocked out, but uh, yeah. what are your plans uh, once it all clears up? Are you, you know, do you have any trips scheduled? Do you have uh, any ideas, or what are you? What are your plans? Everything's really up in the air because of the virus. Um, still hoping to do two Mackinac races this year. Uh, not sure they're going to happen. Hoping to do, there's a race from Holland to Milwaukee that's the feeder race for the Queen's Cup race that this year goes uh, to uh, Grand Haven. Hmm. And I like to do those every year. They're both overnight races. And it's you know a good way to get your act back together so you're ready for a mat. I oh, gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, hoping to be ready to do the Sunfish World Championship in Sarasota if we're able to hold it. Um, hoping that the Midwest Region Championship in Sunfish at uh, Bayview Yacht Club and Crescent Sail occurs. It was supposed to be the end of May. Now it's the middle of August. Um, but it may be a year that we just have our little fleet races out here. And I put one of my beater boats down at the bottom of the hill and go out and cruise around. Mm -hmm. I really don't know what to expect out of this year at all. Um, and if everything does get put back for a whole year, um, then I'll probably, you know, hitch up the trailer and start running around, hopefully, <laughs> somewhat normally, hopefully. I don't really don't know what to expect. I think until there's a vaccine and we find a way to treat people over 60 successfully. Yeah, it's um, going to be hard to figure out what we're doing. It's it's a challenge, and I have lots of friends who are 30, 40, 50 that are like, why are you tying us down? And they just can't understand. You know, maybe they don't have grandma and grandpa anymore. I don't know. I don't get yeah. it. All right, so let's move on to uh, the next thing. Uh, yeah. What do you think about women sailing these days? Women sailing is actually growing, and That's I'm... Good. Going to a women's seminar on Zoom 
on Saturday, the Midwest Women's Sailing Conference. And with my work for Lake Michigan Sail Racing Federation, I've discovered that many of the clubs have a WOW, Women on the Water program. Mm -hmm. But we have just really, really struggled to coordinate and have anything coordinated lake-wide that the women feel part of a lake-wide thing. And so I've actually got myself on the agenda to be able to ask for women that want to help make something coordinated occur, get in touch with me. All right. Um, we'll get in touch with Gail, ladies. So, you know, because I can't run it, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> maxed out. Yeah, you've got your hands full. I am maxed out. I have discovered I am absolutely maxed out. Well, hopefully some of these new people that are sailing and new uh, women that are involved uh, will take the reins and jump in. I'm hoping. All right. So uh, do you have any ideas on ways to grow the sport of sailing, you know, to women, to men, to just everyone in general? How, What kind of thoughts do you have uh, or ideas to help grow the sport? Well, I've joined a U.S. Sailing Committee to have U.S. Sailing realize that they need to be doing more to grow small boat one design sailing. Mm -hmm. It really hasn't had serious attention. All their attention has been poured onto Olympic sailing, which now is so exotic that the everyday classes don't get any attention anymore. There's no publication that addresses the everyday Corinthian sailor. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing that educates younger people. So high school sailors, collegians, recent grads, young professionals on how to become owners and how to get involved. And that used to be an automatic thing when we were young. Yeah. Um, Wait, are you saying I'm old? <laughs> older. Older. Okay, I'm a little wise. Yeah. All right. Um, but then, you know, somehow, too, there's going to have to be facility fleets. And, you know, kind of like these powerboat clubs where you join it and you call up and say, I want it on Saturday from 12 to 4, and you just show up and bring all your cooler and junk, and away you go. Yeah, just sailing club type things, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. It's an idea. It, there's going to be a lot of change. There has to be. Yeah, there's got to be because something. Because I think this financial setback is going to hurt the middle class even worse than they were already struggling. Mm -hmm. And they're the secret to growing the sport. Gotcha. All right. Well, guess what? You've made it through these 20 questions pretty quickly. Um, that was 20? That was 20 questions. Well, wow. I was actually 19. Here's the 20th. Do you have anything else to add? What are your thoughts? Add anything um, you want. Always be safe. No matter what boat you're on, carry a knife. Carry a knife. That's it? And oh, a wait. whistle's a good idea too, but carry a knife. <laughs> wait a minute. I'm realizing I might have missed a question. What's your best advice to new sailors, new people? That might have been it, huh? Um, well, that, and take lessons. I mean, and I say that, and we do have one fellow here that's new to our fleet. He's been sailing now for two and a half years. He learned by studying on the internet. Mm -hmm. And then he did the first virtual Volvo Ocean race. Yeah. And he finished in the top 10,000, huh. which is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I've tried it. I'm nowhere um, close to And then he to bought that. a sunfish, and he only sailed it three or four times that fall and took his wife out once and promptly capsized her into really cold water, and she wants nothing to do with it ever again. Of course. Uh -huh. Which, you know, that happens. Um, but by the end of our second season, he was 0 .01 behind me for the wow. season championship. He's gotten really good and really fast hmm. and it's really cool to watch. So even in your late fifties, you can do this folks. Yeah. <laughs> it can be done in a short period of time. Yep. Just takes Ooh, trying and knowledge. Oh yeah. I've got a, got a new little cat. She runs around and gets in everything. All right. So now anything else to add other than bring a knife? Focus on having fun. 
the whole point behind all this is to have fun. You meet really great, fun people, have good friendships with people like Zane, and uh, see where it takes you. And if you can, support the sport. Volunteer, donate, um, sponsor kids so they can go do what they're trying to do, and uh, help the Olympians because they are gravely underfunded. I've learned way, way too much about that. And I can assure you of that. So I'm floored. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, no. With thank that, you, Gail. thank you. This was fun. Yeah, it, it was pretty simple, pretty painless. So, uh, like I say, hopefully I can get this uh, edited and aired up pretty soon, and I'll let you know. But uh, thank you for your uh, time. Thank you for your answers, and hopefully this helps somebody that might be interested in the sport, wants to know more, wants to get some more ideas. Eh, whatever. If this helps, okay. it's great. So thank you very much, Gail, and I'll be in touch with you soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.